Welcome to Nebraskanomics, where we help Nebraskans remove barriers to opportunity with policy research and legislative advice. I'm your host, Jim Vocal, CEO of the Platt Institute, a Nebraska-based think tank promoting policies that make it easier to get a good job, start a business, and help Nebraskans keep more of what they earn. If you want more economic freedom in Nebraska, then let's get started. No matter what's going on in Washington, states have limited budgets that have to be balanced. Even the most generous helpings of federal spending for states will reach their limit at some point. My guest today is chairman of Nebraska Legislature's Budget Writing Appropriations Committee, and he's been watching all these factors play out in real time through the pandemic and its numerous emergency spending policies. And now he and his colleagues will have to set the priorities to take Nebraska into the next phase of growth in 2022. State Senator John Stinner, welcome to Nebraskanomics. Thank you, thank you for having me. And if you want more conversations like this, uh, YouTube viewers can like and subscribe to our channel or subscribe to the podcast on your favorite listening platform to get notified of our latest episodes. So let's get started now, Senator Stinner. Uh, We've got a session coming up in January and the state is going to be making decisions about allocating the first portion of funding from the American Rescue Plan Act. Now, anytime uh, people hear that we have a significant amount of money coming into the state, whether it's because of revenues or federal spending, naturally, as you can imagine, people are going to start wondering if there's something transformational we can do on the statewide level with those funds. Is there any Thing Nebraskans need to know about how state revenues and federal spending work so they can properly manage their expectations and their aspirations? Yeah, um, actually, uh, I, I need to correct you on one thing. We have received half of the money, $520 million, and that will be allocated, uh, first of all, by a recommendation by the governor as to what, what he sees is important for the state and come to the speaker and then the speaker will make that a bill. There will be a second tranche too, even though we haven't received the funds, we will make application and probably receive those funds in May. We'll be out of session by that time. But my conversations with the governor is, let's allocate the full $1.1 billion, $40 million uh, because time is of the essence. It's, uh, so if those dollars can go out to help uh, where it's needed uh, to be impactful, uh, that's that's what we need to do. Um, as far as the allocation of those dollars, they're one-time spends. It's one-time federal money that comes in. We're trying to decide as a legislature, what's the best uh, use of those funds? What's the most impactful way of spending those funds that'll have you know, a long-term uh, certainly a long-term implications for the state of Nebraska. Um, but we do have some, some issues, certainly workforce issues come up uh, on a frequent basis. Uh, mental health, for an example, is an issue across the state that needs to be addressed. Is there something we can do with these one-time funds to address some of those types of themes? So that's kind of what we're going to look at. I am um, expecting anywhere from 40 to 60 bills individual bills to come to our committee. Uh, We will have a hearing on each one of those bills and decide uh, what we will try to put into that package. And right now I have about $4 billion of requests. So we need to fit those in. First of all, they have to be compliant with ARPA. Secondarily, we'd like to have that test of one-time money for for one-time spend. So that will be kind of the criteria that we're going to be looking at. That's a great overview. I appreciate that. Uh, And and as you know, uh, given your position, our economy was not as heavily impacted uh, because of the shutdown during the pandemic, not just because of government policy, of course, but also the industries that make up our economy here in Nebraska. So with the federal assistance that we received, it's almost like Nebraska's economy got a booster before anyone was even talking about a COVID booster. But now we're seeing some side effects and w- about significant inflation. How does that spike in inflation either impact the strength or flexibility of the state finances over the next couple of years? Yeah, um, inflation has two things. A good part of it is, is inflation generally helps sales tax. 
uh, and sales tax revenue. And many times because of salary increases, it also helps the income tax revenue side of thing. The bad side of that is, and that's something that we tried to address a little bit in in the interim with the governor renegotiating contracts with NAEP, which is the uh, employee state employee uh, union, and then also with the corrections folks, the uh, Federation of uh, the Fraternal Order of Police that oversees or the union it's, as the uh, uh, head of the correction side of things. I think that number is about $70 million to $75 million. I don't have a final number on that yet. So that is impactful, but when you take a look at that, that was put in place because we were having a hard time at the state level uh, retaining and attracting employees. Well, we also have things like nursing homes that we have to address. What's, what's the reimbursement rate? What is the right rate for, for the nursing homes so that they can attract? And we've already seen uh, seven nursing homes and assisted living homes closed because of COVID, because of workforce, because of the lack of revenue to support what they were trying to do. Developmental disabilities on the provider rate side, certainly they're having the same problem. And I'm also hearing from child welfare. And so we'll probably be looking at some deficit requests, not only from the agencies, but then we'll also have some some. Uh, bills uh, to consider as it relates to provider rates and trying to make sure that we're providing the services that we are basically, uh, you know, mandated by the federal government to, uh, to, uh, to have that, those services out there. Okay. That's very helpful. Uh, well, let's shift a little bit to property taxes. Um, no matter how bad people think the property tax situation in Nebraska is at this point. We've now allocated nearly a billion dollars in tax relief programs, and that doesn't even include state aid to education. A lot of taxpayers didn't end up claiming the latest LB1107 tax credit, and the overall local property tax rate is still rising in Nebraska. So for all that Nebraska, the legislature is offering to spend, do you think Nebraskans are getting their money's worth with this approach, or do you have other ideas as it relates to what property tax reform should look like? Well, I, uh, yeah, that's a, a good question, and I can't answer the one about the individuals who haven't applied for the tax credit. I've, I've seen some numbers on that. We, we need to kind of dig down deep into that to find out why. Um, but the second thing is people haven't felt the impact of the next level. So we went from 125 million, which is about 6% of the bill, to now we're going to go to $548 million, which will be 25%. So the real true impact of what we've done in the legislature uh, won't be felt till this time around. Um, now, we do have a line item I did check out on my own tax return um, that should alert the accountants and people who are preparing the tax to uh, incorporate that. Uh, so we'll see how this all works. I don't know about pass-throughs or corporations or any, anything like that. So we really need to dig down into the numbers to find out why people aren't really utilizing it. Of course, we also increased uh, 275 to 313, the credit fund, which is a direct credit. It's biased more toward agriculture because there's a 20% uh, increase in their assessed valuations in there. So it's a little bit more biased toward ag. I think with that combination should keep everybody up to date as far as the credit's concerned, plus a larger and larger credit. Is this the correct way of doing it? Uh, it's yeah, the eyes and beholder. Obviously, uh, Blueprint talks about expanding the sales tax base and doing something not only with property tax, but also with uh, income tax. That's a thought that is that that has been taken off off the table with this government. So what we've been trying to do is to tamp down and hold down government spending and using that incremental change to make these, uh, make these changes as, as it relates to property tax. Um, that's the only way we've been able to do it. So that's about where we're at today. Um, is there a better way? I, you know, we'll just have to see, see what the next legislature does. That, that's fair enough. And you mentioned uh, Blueprint Nebraska. And, and during that Blueprint Nebraska process, reducing or eliminating taxes was identified as the top three, one of the top three concerns for the state's economic vitality. Uh, you've always been a straight shooter. You just explained, uh, you just showed that in your previous explanation. 
uh, and you don't overpromise one way or another. What do you think can be real, realistically accomplished uh, to remedy some of the concerns people think stand in the state's way uh, of reducing further taxes in Nebraska? Well, I, I think, uh, first of all, nobody likes paying taxes, period. I don't either. Um, but when I look at the budget, you know, we've got three real main themes in this budget. One of them's education, and education is about 45 to 47 percent of this budget. That's our future, and I think past legislatures have looked at that. Um, obviously, it's one of those situations where it provides that workforce and, and actually provides a future for the state of Nebraska. The second one is really the have-tos, and that's about 35% going on 37% of the budget, and that's aid to individuals. That's dictated to us by federal law and federal mandate. And of course, then you've got a good portion of it, 12% left over for corrections. And that's obviously um, uh, for safety purposes as state patrol, that's the uh, prison situation and the judges. There isn't a whole lot of room in that budget as far as where you can actually cut down. Now, can you look at programs that are effective or not effective? I don't think anybody in the state would say, hey, we need to lower the amount of money that we're providing for education. I don't hear anybody saying that we need to lower the cost associated with, with the safety side and we can't do anything with individuals. So that's the box that you have to work with from the expenditure and service side. Now, how do you do that from a revenue side to support that? Um, is there some other formula? Is it all sales tax oriented? Uh, there may be some other ideas out there uh, that, that actually provide the resources for the state to continue to provide the services that are required. You mentioned the governor's opposition previously. Where do you think the legislature stands on uh, expanding the sales tax base overall in principle? I, I think overall, in principle, I think people, I, I myself would be, I would be somewhat against it. I'd have to really take a hard look at what we're trying to do because it becomes a regressive tax. And if we could eliminate some of that regressiveness on that, on that side, um, you know, I'd, I'd probably take a, a, a more favorable look to it. I don't like increasing taxes. Uh, but that one might be prudent if you can bring it down and make it fair for everybody. Yeah, um, in fairness, I, I should have said in conjunction with uh, lower income and property tax rates, not right. just for the basis of uh, expand the sales tax base. Right. And, and from that aspect, I have been a proponent of that, but that does, doesn't work with this administration. So let's let's look ahead in uh, to your final year in 2022. The, the session starting in January. Uh, where do you think the legislature's focus should be, and where would you say Nebraska status is with its overall financial health? Overall financial health should be very very strong. Um, if you saw the report the last time, we're almost a billion dollars in a rainy day fund. That's compare and contrast that to pulling it down into the three four hundred range. Um, during the financial crisis. So from that side, uh, the fiscal posture of the state is looks to be very, very strong. Um, we do have right now about $400 million in excess over the, the uh, a mandatory 3% reserve for cash, and that's your working capital side. Um, that will probably be, getting, be eaten up with uh, some of the salary increases, provider rate increases. We'll see how that all goes through this session. Uh, as far as focus, you know, we still have the prison situation and we set the stage with the governor last time in allocating dollars, half of it, 115 million. Some of it was set aside for reforms. Some of it was actually appropriated to look at site and uh, plans and business, and, you know, the development of the blueprint so that we can get a firm grasp on just what we're building and what the costs associated with that is. How far along there was other pieces that corrections got in that process. I can't tell you what kind of reforms that we need to have because the trajectory of 100 to 150 to 200 more people every year coming into the system doesn't really work because you're going to build something that's going to be 20 years out. And so you have to have an accurate projection on just what you need to build. Is it maximum security prison? Is it minimum or medium? You know, de depending on that blend, that affects cost. The second thing is how big. 
And if you don't lower that trajectory, which may be reforms, it may be some other ideas that, that are out there that hopefully CJI will provide us. Um, you know, we'll, we'll take a look at all of those things, but that needs to be addressed. We will probably still allocate that second portion of that so that the state has at least sequestered those dollars and then try to collect all the information to make a prudent decision. Uh Anything else the legislature should focus on besides prison uh, related things in 2022? Yeah, I think uh, the thing that I'm going to try to impress upon the legislature is inflation is impacting us. I think if you did a look back over the last decade, for an example, the salary increases were average about 2%. As you look at decades, 60 years, and I did take a look back, normally salary increases range from three, three and a half percent. So as you look forward and start to take a look at where the state's going to be, that two, two and a half to two percent budget that we brought to the floor probably will be more like a three, three and a half percent budget impacted predominantly by inflation and making sure that we have attracted a quality workforce and have been able to retain that quality workforce. So that's something that I think so. Heads up as you move forward. I think it's something that you you actually pro can project out at least over the next two to three years uh, to take a look at making sure that when you pass things like tax legislation or that you pass something that's going to increase costs, you can really kind of assimilate that out into the future. Uh, one final question going into 2022. There is a uh some excess revenues as you had indicated, is it important for tax reform that we have the pay fors going forward? Uh, so we avoid situations like Kansas as an example? I, I think prudent management practices would dictate that. I think, uh, you know, we have to be careful in what we do that affects revenue, but we also have to be careful what we do on the expenditure side as well. And I'm not an advocate for new programs at all. I think we've got enough new programs or enough programs. If there's something new that comes along that the legislature, I'm only one vote. So the legislature, if it can get that 33 votes, that's fine. On the tax side, I think we should always look at taxes uh, and what we could do on a productive nature. Now, we just went through a session where I think it, it should be called a tax reform session. Uh, you know, we, we address Social Security. We address military pay. We addressed corporate income tax. We addressed property tax. And um, those dollars, if you start to add up what those dollars were, they are very, very significant dollars. We held down expenses right now to 1.8%. Um, I'm not going to guarantee that that's what it's going to look like after, after we make the budgetary adjustments that, uh, that I'm seeing right now, just, just in deficit requests that I have in front of me. Now, nobody gets to stay in the legislature for more than eight years, and I've certainly enjoyed working with you over the last uh, seven and a half, and uh, you're entering your last session. You've been a great appropriations chair, uh, but soon, in 2023, lawmakers will have to select your successor as appropriations committee chair uh, and follow on your footsteps. What characteristics should future members of the Unicamera look for in a person seeking to lead your committee and what advice would you have for that person that is selected as your successor? Well, the one thing that I look at, I got six members that I'm leaving behind. Three of us are, are now termed out. Uh, those six members are all accustomed to looking at and working through the budget side. So I think all of them have a level of competence and, and qualification. So you look at who has the, the most understanding of the budget and the budget process, Who's the best balanced? Because you hear a whole lot of things from a lot of, a lot of different sources. So you have to keep your balance in that. And who's, who's intellectually curious? You know, you've got to be able to dig into, into the numbers, but you also have to understand what that, what that agency is about from, why, from a statutorily standpoint, from a mission standpoint, and how those appropriations dollars are being spent. So... Uh, and a lot of times that takes digging into it. So, and then you have to be a good listener. You can't, you can't be somebody that's going to tell everybody something. You have to be able to, to listen to what they have to say, completely listen uh, from almost an empathetic uh, side of things. So those would be qualities I would look for. Senator Stinner, thank you for your leadership in the Unicameral, and thank you for joining me today on Nebraska Economics. Thank you. 
Thank you for listening to today's episode. If you want more economic freedom in Nebraska, please visit platinstitute.org to make a donation to help fund our research and advocacy. Or you can subscribe to our newsletter and learn about today's most important issues facing Nebraskans. It's time to stop the status quo. Let's remove economic barriers and make Nebraskans proud.